We want to welcome you to our service. Uh, if you're just joining, uh, we are so thankful that you are with us uh, today. And a big thank you to the team that is making today happen. I'm, I'm like really proud of, of our church today. You guys are just like really stepping into some really cool space. And, uh, and love you guys. And thanks for being here. And thanks for being with us at home. Um, I hope that you guys are in just an awesome place at home and you're worshiping with your families and uh, whether you've got some pancakes or bagels or, you know, that, like that warm coffee brewing, uh, you, us, we are a family in this moment and we know that uh, nothing can take away our hallelujah, our family, or the mission of God. And so we're excited to be in this uh, together and I thought what would be the most appropriate way uh, to start today is honoring... Um, how our president has asked us uh, to step into a national day of prayer. Uh, how cool is that, that uh, we have our powers and leadership that be that are calling out for prayer. And so we want to honor that, and we want to, we want to uh, ask you to join us um, in honoring a, uh, our national day of prayer and entering into prayer with us before we move forward. So let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we echo the words that we have sung so far that there is nothing that can take away our hallelujah, Lord, that um, your cross and uh, an empty grave has made it so that uh, our hallelujah will remain. And so we praise you with that hallelujah. We say that you are our rock and you are our refuge. You are beautiful in all times. You are capable and able. And we worship you and we love you. And we come before you now in the name of Jesus and we ask that you would Fill us with your spirit and help us to pray. Lord, we pray for the world, and we ask that you would bring, in the midst of uh, this virus and our current health situation, we ask that you would bring um, the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Lord, that you would give to the world what the world doesn't have, that it would be a gift from your Holy Spirit to the world, the peace of Christ that comes through faith in his finished work. Father, we ask that you would move in a time like this where there are so many hearts that are troubled uh, to find a peace that they've never found before and to be encouraged if they know you in that peace. And so, Father, first we, we pray your peace upon the world. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for those who have lost. Um, we know that uh, this, this virus has taken life already. And so we pray the comfort of Christ uh, to the world, specifically to those who have lost family members and friends and moms and, and dads and, and brothers and sisters and whoever it may be. And Father, we pray um, because we know that you are close to the brokenhearted. And so we ask for the comfort of Christ uh, that belongs to those who look to you in times of brokenheartedness. And Lord, we pray for the suffering those who uh, potentially have contracted this virus and are suffering from symptoms and, uh, and are, are just walking through a very difficult time uh, health-wise, we pray for those who suffer emotionally right now. Lord, we, we understand that this has triggered um, uh, a, a rather fresh and unprecedented amount of fear and panic. And, uh, and, and so, Father, uh, what we want to pray for is, is we want to pray uh, for the healing of Christ to those who suffer physically, uh, emotionally, and mentally, even spiritually. God, we, we ask that you would meet them with the absolute healing of Christ, and you would bind up their wounds, and you would point them to the Savior and healer named Jesus. And Father, we pray for the, the caregivers right now who are giving care, whether it be in homes or nursing homes or hospitals or uh, wh whatever uh, context it might be. Uh, Father, you are... Uh, the ultimate caregiver, and uh, you have met our, our needs in Christ. And so we pray for those who, who live that out on a practical level, day in and day out, specifically during this time, that you would give them the strength of Christ. Lord, that they would walk and run and not grow weary, that they would um, be able to meet the needs, uh, whatever they might be, uh, with a strength that is not their own. Father, we're asking for the strength of Christ uh, to specifically fall upon and fill all of those who offer care uh, at this time. Lord, I pray for the leaders. Uh, we pray for the leaders of this government, of governments all over the world. We pray for church leaders and business leaders, whatever uh, 
type of capacity a leader may find himself or herself in, uh, Lord, we, we ask that you would fill them with the wisdom of Christ, that they might have a wisdom that is not their own to navigate a place that nobody has ever been. And so, Father, we ask that you would bestow upon the leaders uh, a wisdom that is divine and supernatural, the wisdom of Christ upon all of those uh, who lead. Lord, we pray for the lost during this time. Lord, we know that um, uh, as, as our country has asked uh, for prayer, uh, we know that uh, there are many people who don't know you, Jesus, who are looking for something now, who uh, have given attention uh, to you, God, uh, maybe in a way that they've never given it before. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give them the love of Jesus. That the, that the radical, passionate, um, overcoming, meet you where you are, love of Christ would bring revival to the lost in the midst of a time where there is so much uncertainty and pain and hurt. So, Father, as we navigate these unclear waters, I pray specifically for those who have, uh, they don't have the hope of Christ. They don't have faith. They don't understand your love. God, would you meet them in the midst of their chaos and like the father who wraps his arms around the prodigal, would you wrap the love of Christ around the many who are drowning in their chaos and worry? Would you wrap them in the love of Christ? And then, fa Father, finally we pray for the church and we pray uh, for the unity of Christ to bind us together like you never have before. Father, I pray that you would bring to life John 17 in a new and fresh way, Lord, that it would be uh, like fresh manna to us, and you would bring us together, both out of necessity and out of choice, Father, where we might have affections that uh, uh, have, have been made new uh, for one another. God, where, where friendships might be renewed and restored, God, where relationships might grow into spaces that they've never been before. Father, I pray that you would hear your son Jesus in his prayer in John 17, that they might be one so the world would know that you have sent me. Father, would you bring about an unprecedented move of unity amongst your church? And in so doing, would you help us not just to survive as a church, but rather to go out on mission and to see the world one for the resurrected Christ. Father, we cannot do these things, but we come to you in faith and ask you and you alone to do them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us um, for that moment. Well, it's probably bigger than we thought. It's probably more vast than anyone would have imagined. It's probably more powerful than anyone would have probably dreamt. And it's probably more contagious than we ever could wrap our minds around. Now, I'm not talking about the coronavirus. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about the power and the vastness and the, and the contagiousness of the person of God. That is where we will be this morning, asking the Spirit to reorient us and refocus us on the person of God. The name of this message is uh, God Is. God Is. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Psalm 46 continues. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is... In the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. 
The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is your God. Avenue Church and joining world, wherever you might be. This is a, uh, a time for us to reorient ourselves to who God is and not just what all of the information and the data might tell us is going on around us. This is your time. I think that's an important phrase. If we can get that up on the screen. This is, this is uh, your time. Go to the next slide here, please, Matt. I feel like um, this is a twofold uh, statement because it, it pertains uh, to God. This is your time, God. God is not surprised by the recent health situation. He's not shocked. He's not backed into a corner. He is not worrying about what's next. This, this, is, this is God's time. He's very present, very hopeful, very powerful in the midst of this. God is in control. His throne has not been tipped to the right or to the left. This is God's time as much as it was before this came and as much as it will be after. But listen, it's also our time. Did you know that? This is your time. This is my time. This is our time as the church, the called out people of God, to live with the joy and the confidence that is becoming of only a God who is our strength and our refuge. This is our time to take a step forward. This is our time to lead, as I heard uh, somebody from the Church United uh, gathering that I was a part of via phone uh, this week. The church should not be following, rather the church should be leading. This is our time. We, of all people, should know how to respond and walk in the midst of the nations that rage and the sea that roars. We have a God who has already defeated our greatest enemy and continues to give us what we need day after day. I would even go so far to say this is your time and the world is waiting and watching for us to stand in the gap where they can't get. This is your time. Well, let's look at um, some of the reasons why this might be true of this being our time and his time. First of all, this is uh, a teaching through Psalm 46. So if you have your Bibles, you'll want to make sure that you're following along and, and take some notes, please. I think they'll be uh, helpful uh, to you this particular uh, week. And so as we look at Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3, we see God's promises. God's promises. This is um, the first stop in this particular psalm where uh, it doesn't start with the context of the psalmists. Much of uh, the material that helped to influence this came from different sources, but one of the sources, so I don't just have to keep quoting over and over the really good stuff that I might give you, is from David Guzik in his commentary called Enduring uh, Word. Um, he, we talk about here um, God's promises, and let, let me set the context for you, because the psalmist doesn't talk about what's happening around them. They actually just jump right to the person of God. In a lot of the Psalms, it talks about a war that's happening, or it talks about some of the things that are actually going on in that particular context. This Psalm does, doesn't give you any buildup. It just starts off with God 
is. Wouldn't that be awesome if that's how you woke up? God is. Not what shut down, not our schools open or not, not where am I going to get this, or how many days of supply do we have, or what does this person say, or who, what if, what if like that's how we started? We woke up and it was like, boom, God is. God is my refuge. God is my strength. Man, what an amazing way to start your day. It's how the psalmist starts. Now, now the, the, the psalmists here, um, they're identified as the sons of Korah, which means that they were Levites and, and most likely musicians. Okay, so, so Levites would be people who worked for and at the temple, and, and it looks like their specific job was, was musicians. And I love musicians, do you not? I mean, it's easy for me to say with a, with a room, we got about half, half music, and they're actually all in the front row, so I really love um, musicians. But one of the cool things that musicians do for us is they bring us into the presence of God in a way that we oftentimes can't get there on our own. They are a very God is oriented people. I mean, as soon as you start hearing that music start and you begin to enter in, it's like something shifts. And I want to tell you why it shifts. Because your mind and your heart have shifted to what the world is, to who God is. And musicians do that for us. Thank you, musicians. Your role, there's really no words to put to your role in the kingdom of God. So thank you. God's promises, verses 1 through 3. If we can see that next slide that kind of highlight some of these uh, initial promises. Um, He promises to be a refuge and a strength and a very present help in trouble. Over 23 years ago, I stood in a ceremony that would start outdoors in some pretty cloudy weather and end up indoors because we got poured on. But my then-to-be wife said, let's go for it, even though it looked pretty daunting outside. And yes, it was our wedding day. And we stood across from each other, and I don't think we had gotten to the vows while we were outside. I can remember running in in the midst of the rain and asking, are we married yet? And I don't, I don't think we were. I don't think we had done the promises. But then at some point in the uh, ceremony, we stood across from each other, and we made promises like to have and to hold, and to cherish, and to honor, above all else, until death do us part. And those vows have helped us, over the last 23 years, maintain a relationship that has flourished and grown, and uh, been just life-giving to both of us. But I'm here to tell you, as half of the people who took vows that day, I have not maintained my vows at 100%. Far from it. There have been days and there have been moments when I have not honored and cherished and loved my wife like I believe I promised to in that day. Now, I've been faithful in marriage and uh, I've been a one-woman man and I've tried to pursue my wife, but certainly there have been times when I have backed away from my vows, specifically based on how I felt at the moment. I can remember the first three years of our marriage, um, much of that was based on us speaking two different languages. Her language was a language of acts of service. My language was a language of uh, affirmation and come in and would you please like, can you touch me please and make me feel good. So if you're familiar with the, the five love languages, I was like a touch guy and a say nice things about me guy, and she was a let's clean the house girl. And I was probably speaking my language, and she was probably speaking her language, and, and for a while we kind of um, found ourselves at like this place where we just, we needed to work through some things. We needed to learn some things because we were speaking two different languages. Imagine being in a house where somebody spoke Spanish and somebody spoke French. It just would be a little bit difficult to uh, maintain that intimacy, uh, or even maintain the vows that you, that you took. And then around year, I don't know if it was like year seven or year eight, I remember thinking, um, hard to put into words, but like, uh, um, uh, it was just hard. I don't even know what I was thinking. It was just kind of hard. And it had lost a bit of its luster, and, 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 and it seemed like I maybe had, had backed away from some of the passion uh, that I once had, and, and so we went through a, a stretch 
uh, like that. And, and, and then even recently, I've been uh, shown through the grace and kindness of God that I feel like I have been a much better parent than spouse. Or at least I've been giving more of my time and energy to just crushing it as a dad and not as a husband. And so uh, I have seen that over the years, I have um, kept the spirit of my vows, but in some ways I've backed away uh, from them. Well, I'm here to tell you about a God who never backs away from his vows, who never falters in his promises to us. Let's look at these promises. Our God is our refuge. What that means is a hiding place. He is our um, protection. He is the one that we can run to in times of trouble. This is certainly a time where we are looking for refuge, where we are looking for protection. And our God offers that. We are never so safe as when we are running to Jesus as our refuge, no matter what we are running or hiding from. Jesus never backs away. There's never a year seven in your relationship. There's never a language communication barrier. There's never a time when Jesus takes his eye off you in order to do something else more urgent. The faithfulness of Jesus as your refuge is radically present today and will be tomorrow and the next day. You are safe in your refuge in your refuge. Our strength, our strength, strength is a a power far greater than ourselves. It is, um, it is, uh, we we talked a little bit about the idea of power a few weeks ago in, in our last series. It is, it is a supernatural and divine force that we don't have. God is our strength, so we are empowered. No matter how you feel, Spurgeon says no matter, no, no, he, he talks about it like this, um, that they can be as weak as, and he names an animal I'm not really familiar with, but they can be as weak as this or as weak as the reed, but God is their strength. God is the one who strengthens us when we find ourselves confused or, or, or looking to the left or looking to the right. God is our divine force that never backs away from his promise to be that. So no matter how you feel, no matter what you have been experiencing as it pertains to strength or fear or lack thereof, I'm here to remind you that God is faithful to his promise to be your strength in the midst of everything that's happening today. God is our strength, so we are empowered. So we are empowered. It's, it's kind of a uh, paradox, if you will, to think about uh, being empowered when you feel so weak. Have any of you guys felt weak this week? Have you felt moments of weakness? I'm just going to ask our, we've got, we've got a little, we've got, our, we've got our musicians here, we've got some people who are helping. To, so like there's, there's been like a couple of moments where I felt my heart like pounding. And I'm like, getting kind of, I feel like I'm getting kind of caught up in maybe the what ifs, you know? Hard to put, put into words. And, and then I thought about, um, I talked to Sam. Sam was supposed to preach today, and we talked about, like, it seems like it's an appropriate moment for, for me to share a message, and, and Sam will be preaching to us next week, and it'll be awesome. And, but I thought about this moment right here, and I began to feel the weight of both this moment and stepping into a place of encouragement when we so desperately need it and the weightiness of my inability to perform that task, my unworthiness. And um, it kind of stole me away for a while. So whether you've been stolen away by what's happening around you or you've been stolen away by the the lack of of faith or strength that you may be experiencing, man, I am here 
to remind you that God has not backed away from being your strength. The heart of God is for you to hear that he is your strength even when you are weak. (laughs) Maybe even more experienced in your weakness if I understand the scriptures correctly that when I am weak, then I am strong because his grace is sufficient. A very present help, a very present help in times of trouble. I would imagine that um, we feel like we are in a time of trouble. And you know the cool thing about God is he never tells us to fake it. I love that about God. Like, it's trouble. Like, we, we're in trouble. Like, it, it, there, virus and sickness and spreading and what about this? Like, the, there's times that are uncertain. And so we don't have to pretend like it's not what it is. But we certainly are called to remember who God is in the midst of the trouble, a very present help. He is relevant to your trouble. He is present to your trouble. God is our help, so we are resourced. Did you know you guys are resourced? Fully right now. Whether, whether you feel like you have enough to eat, whether you feel like um, your health is where it needs to be, whether you're not sure of where your finances are going, you are fully resourced in Christ. Those of us who have come to Christ as our refuge from our sin, we've trusted in the finished work of Christ at the cross, the empty grave we believe belongs to us, it is a payment for our sin, we've turned from our sin and our suffering, and we've trusted in Christ and Christ alone. If that describes you, then that means you know Christ as your refuge. You are looking to him as your strength, and you have him as a very present help today. It means you are fully resourced. I was outside of Trader Joe's this morning. Did my run, went to Einstein Bagels, got my coffee on, and what was happening outside of Trader Joe's was a, like, kind of minor mass of people waiting to get in to Trader Joe's, feeling deeply under-resourced. Now, I think you should have the food you need. I think you should be wise about your resources. This isn't like uh, trust God and don't do anything. But this is a reminder to be informed, to take the correct steps in order to care for your family and those around you, but to remember that you are fully resourced not only to survive this, but to be a blessing to the nations with your joy and your confidence that are inherent to believers and followers of Christ alone. You're fully resourced for that, to not just survive, but to be used in this time. I love what um, Allison wrote me, Allison Hicks, um, at some point during this, and she had some helpful suggestions on how to be a blessing. I mean, isn't that cool when you've got people who are thinking, how can we step up and be a blessing rather than how can I hunker down and, like, survive this? Because here's the thing. God is not just your refuge so you can hide. He's also your strength and your help so you can go. You don't go outside of the refuge, but as you take refuge in Christ, then you can go. Her ideas were really practical and simple. I I, I thought they were pretty cool. Call somebody up. Text somebody and let them know the only agenda for the phone call is you wanted to pray for them. You're resourced to do that. She said, um, go and like make a meal for a neighbor and leave a little note and and write down one or two of um, uh, verses that talk about the peace of Christ for that neighbor. I'm I'm not a meal maker guy, but I can make cookies. So I was thinking like, man, let's let's do some bakery blessing. Let's just get after it this week and, and, and make some chocolate chip cookies and leave a little note that it talks about, hey, praying for you and one or two verses on the blessings of Christ. You can do that. You're resourced to do that in your neighborhood. There's going to be people who need child care. There's going to be people who are trying to navigate jobs. There's going to be people who need finances. Let's be aware of the needs because we're resourced enough and step into those needs rather than having a myopic focus that turns and looks at us and us alone. You see, the promises of God change things. 
The question is, are you going to focus more on, on who God is or what's next on your news sources? Secondly, God's presence. God's presence, verses 4 through 7. This passage of uh, 4 through 7 begins with this uh, idea of a river. And I just, I did not know what the river was. I was like, what's the river? I went to Spanish River Church. They planted us. That's cool. But I don't understand this river. And so I did some research. And, and here's, here's what I came up with. I didn't come up with it. This is what I learned. Um, so there's no river in, in Jerusalem. So the psalmist, he's not writing from experience. He's not writing from the fact that there's a river that he can look at and see. It's, it appears that he's writing only of a promise of a river. And we see that promise in Ezekiel 47. We also see a promise of a river in, uh, in Revelation 22. And, and the idea is it makes glad the city of God because it's life-giving water in a dry land. I love the fact that the psalmist seems to be writing about something that they can't see or experience, but they're choosing to live out of. It's something that they have not seen yet. It's something they have not experienced yet, but they're choosing to live out of a reality that God promises. Man, how beautiful would that be if we started living out of a promise that we can't see yet and we haven't experienced yet, but we know is true because Christ is our refuge and our strength. What if we began to walk in the promises of God and his goodness and his renewal of all things one day, no matter what happens today? What if the promises of God became more of our reality and we started walking in those rivers? How glad would that make the city of Delray and Boynton and Boken? Lake Worth, our region. What are we walking in right now? So here's, here's where we see the presence of God. The Lord of hosts, if we can get that next slide, is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And so here, here's, like, here's like the idea here, guys. The, the presence of God changes everything. You'll see this consistently. That's, that's the promises of God change everything. And the presence of God changes everything. Morgan writes, the secret of the confidence is the consciousness of the nearness of God. I'm not going to say that fast. There's a lot of big words there. I'm going to read it again, though. The secret of the confidence, and I believe he's talking about this psalmist, is the consciousness of the nearness of God. God's presence. The river connected to his presence. I don't think you can have the river and walk in faith of what is not yet without the presence of God connected to that. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. But what does that mean? The Lord of hosts. Yahweh Saboeth. It means the commander of armies, the Lord of hosts. The psalmist could have used a ton of different verbiage there. Could have said Jehovah. Could have said, uh, 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 he could have used God. He could have, he could have used a lot of names for God to mention that he is with us. But he is drawing out something specific. When you see the Lord of hosts, it means that this is the God of the armies, both the army that is divine and the army of, like, Israel, the army of the peoples. There is a God that commands both of those armies. And what the psalmist is saying is that God, that commander of the armies that you can see and the unseen armies that have won battle after battle after battle, that God. with us. He's not distant. He's not a hopeful thought. He's with me. 
now. And he's with you now. The God of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. David Guzek talks about Jacob and he says this. He says, um, when you see the God of Jacob mentioned, you, you're reminded of two things. You're reminded of a covenant that God has made that goes way back. And, and so uh, you might hear like Jacob and Abraham and Isaac. And that's a reference to the fact that God promised to do something through uh, a certain group of people. And, and namely bring his Messiah and, and, and bring salvation to the world and be a light to the, to the Gentiles and all the nations. And, and, and so when you see the God of Jacob, you're reminded that God is faithful to his covenant. Then when God makes a promise, man, he's super faithful uh, to that promise. And secondly, God's not only faithful, God's graceful. Because if you know anything about the life of Jacob, you know that Jacob was probably not the dude you wanted your daughter to marry. I mean, I want, I'm not, I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to, like, like, throw rocks at my, like, you know, kind of the uh, faith of our fathers type, type guy. I'm just saying there were some moments in Jacob's life that were not awesome. And yet God was gracious to Jacob. So we have a faithful and a gracious God who is with us as we walk through moments where we might not be awesome where we walk through moments where we might forget the goodness of God as we sang, and where we might forget that we have a God of the armies who is with us right now. So much so, we see that in the Old Testament there, there's a king who finds out like, like, um, that God's going to go with him into battle, and he, and he puts his musicians out either on the front lines or close to the front. It was like God lets him know that he's going to be with him, and it changes everything as he goes into battle. And so now he goes into battle with, with like praise leading the way, not problems. Man, how awesome would it be if the rest of the day in this week we went into our battle with praise leading the way? Not problems. God's power. This is the third stop here in this uh, psalm. God's power, verses 8 through 9. Come behold the works of the Lord. So the invitation is to come and see what God is doing and actually has done. And um, you might prepare your hearts to think like it's going to be good things. Because if, if I invite you to be like, hey, come and see what God has done, you would think that like I would be showing you my marriage or something like really cool that God has built or restored. Hold that thought. Have you guys ever met my four-year-old son, Cade? Okay. He is awesome. And one of his gifts that he has right now, I'm not really sure the, where it classifies under the list of spiritual gifts. I don't see it yet. I'm just going to give, I'm going to give it my own class. And so, you know, not adding to the scripture. I'm just saying, this is, this is what he's gifted at right now. You ready? He's gifted at destruction. There's pretty much nobody that can destroy things like Kate. There is a life season of I would say, you know, certain things in our house, whether they are his or not, that get about a week and a half before he destroys them. And sometimes he means to, and sometimes he doesn't. He's just a destroyer. He is a destructive little kid. And it doesn't mean that he's like, needs to be disciplined for it or whatever. He'll bring me his, his truck that he loved, and he'll just be like, it's broken, and, and I can't fix it. And how did it get broken? Well, I think he was like dropping it and, and doing something. I don't know what, how he broke it necessarily, but it, but it was, you know, you're supposed to run it on the ground, and I think he like, left it from this space to that space, and then his sister got a microphone for Christmas. Thankfully, there's two of them, because he took one and pulled it up, pulled it right out of its socket. I mean, this kid destroys things. And right now, it's hard to sometimes see the good in it. 
man, my wife can be like, she'd get worn out by him. It's like, man, this kid destroys everything. But I want to tell you something about Cade. You may or may not know this. There's a, there's a secret about Cade out here. I'm going to tell you. A Cade's an arrow. And um, the Bible tells me that. And uh, here's, by faith, what Cade's going to do one day. We're going to send him out of our home. And he is going to specifically pierce the wall that stands in the church and in the world between races. And it's going to be Cade's, again, by faith, this is how I'm praying, it's going to be Cade's life that destroys a wall that has separated the church for years. Cade is going to need that destructive mindset one day, redeemed under the grace of Christ, to be an arrow that splits the wall that stands between the church, specifically between the white church and the African-American church. That is the prayer for Cade. That is how I, I feel like God has asked me to sharpen his arrow. And so one day God is going to redeem that destructive behavior for good. And that is the destruction that you are invited to see here in this passage. God does not only build things, he destroys things. What does he destroy in this passage? He destroys desolations. It says wars cease, or he brings desolation. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariot. You see, sometimes we need to have a God that builds and restores things, and sometimes we need a God that is strong enough to destroy what we can't destroy. I believe we are in a time where we need a God to destroy what we cannot destroy. Come, let us remember that our God has a very destructive, powerful, and yet redemptive history. And let us believe that he has the power to destroy what we cannot destroy today. The power of God changes everything, especially our enemies. And so, as we think about, well, what do we do with all this? God's promises and God's presence and God's power. I mean, I mean, how does, how do these things encourage us and, and where do we go? Believing, even in that last point, that the destructive nature of God is for our good when we remember that God has destroyed our sin problem and he's destroyed death and he's destroyed our enemy, Satan, through a cross and an empty grave. What do we do with that? What do we do with the power and the presence and the promises of God? I think first we need to ask two questions. Two questions. Number one, where are you? Where are you right now? It's good for a leader to define reality. I think that's Max Dupree. The first, the first job of the leader is to define reality. And so I just would ask you on a question, where are you? There's probably a spectrum. Let's say one is not worried at all, and ten is you're like in panic mode. Um, some of you might be here. Let's see, a, let's see the next slide. Some of you might be here. Yeah. Some of you might be like a one. Like, I don't even know really what's going on, and my world is happy. This happens to be Cora. She's my four-year-old now, and we went uh, this week to the mall because it was her, her birthday, and Daddy took his daughter to the mall and he took care of her. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, just, we, were, we, we spreed it up a little bit. Justice. You can spree it up when, like, the gifts are flip-flops and um, uh, I... I shadow. I don't know if you can see it, but she actually was so excited that she had to do her own eyes like immediately. And so she got the thing out. We're right in that town center. Quite a sight, Cora and I, right? Walking through the mall in the midst of this season. Like, I, is the mall even going to be open? I like, we get, and there she is just like, I'm dad, I'm so, and she was so excited in the store. And when we walked in, she walked past the cotton candy machine and was like, can I get cotton candy? And I was like, uh, yeah. Now I had been texting my wife and, and towards the end of our journey there, she's, she's like, did you, I forget what she said, but like, did you find a bunch of money? And I was like, uh, 
So let me ask you a question. Um, how many times has our daughter turned four? And she's like, uh, once, and it's tomorrow. So this was actually her birthday eve. So my wife and I had some fun bantering about it. But man, Cora and I were just having a day. And this is her cotton candy. It's not just any cotton candy. That's Hello Kitty cotton candy. And if you look at Cora, she's a one. She doesn't know what's going on or how it could possibly affect her. She's, like, she's kind of out of it. Some of you might be at the 10 spectrum where you're like, oh, my goodness, world's over. What am I going to do? I'm in panic mode. First question is just like, where are you? Where are you? Give yourself a rating on that list. Are you a four? Are you a seven? Second question, what do you want? Like, what do you want right now? What do you most want today? You want it to be gone? Do you want to be safe? Do you want life to go back to normal? Like, what is your most prevailing desire right now? Maybe for some of you, it's, it's Jesus. And you're like, man, I just want Jesus, just like I did before this thing hit. I just want Jesus in this present moment. I don't know what you want. Sometimes I don't know what I want. I'd put myself maybe like less than a five, but I can go up to a seven pretty quick maybe. And what do I want? Oftentimes I'm a, like addicted to my feelings, so I want to feel good. And, you know, I don't know. Like, hard for me to always tell exactly what I want, but one of the things that God has convicted me of is that I, my desire for Jesus is um, it's not where he wants it and it's not where I want it. And uh, yeah, I've, I've just been repenting of that and asking God to set a fire in me because I want to want him more. Well, as we close, there's something that's fueling your number and your want. Here's the invitation of Jesus. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I learned something in this passage. I learned that this invitation is first directed to the enemies of God. It's not directed to us as sort of like his people to just simply quiet down and, and live a peaceful life. This initially be still and know that I am God, is directed to the enemies of God. And, and here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Hey, enemies, that you, you think you might be advancing. You need to settle down. Hit the brakes. Slow, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. This is like in the face of the enemy, a reminder to them of who God is. And I started thinking about, well, I'm not an enemy, but I certainly suffer from unbelief, which characterizes the enemies of God. And so I'm taking this invitation for me and for us as well. Be still and know. So sort of our final thought here. Check this out. What would this look like this week? What would it look like this week if we were still and knew that God was God. I don't believe it's inactivity. I just believe that it would be a different activity. And the first one is remember Jesus. As far as, you know, we started this passage with the promises of God. And, it, and it's, um, a, I believe it's a call for us to remember Jesus. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I, I was at um, a local new coffee shop. Sam walked in. We, we, it was just kind of this cool thing up in Boynton, a um, place called Common Grounds. It was awesome. Highly recommend. Anyways, I, I started reading this psalm, and I just I couldn't get over verse 1. I read it over and over and over again. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So as we enter into this week, we've got some things that are going to hopefully encourage you. 24-7 prayer uh, this week. You can call into the number that Mitch gave you. Uh, 6 o'clock, we're going to do a God is, like, devotion for you because it's going to be right before you start to re-engage the news. 
And you're going to hear from either a pastor or a staff member um, or even just a leader that gives you like maybe a 10-minute encouragement before you re-engage to, to the world's news. But I want to help you remember Jesus this week. I think it's a really big deal for us to being still and knowing God. And here's the very practical thing. Just memorize verse 1. That's, that's all I want you to do. That's all, that's all, can we commit to do that this week? Can we commit to memorize God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble? I think that's going to help us remember Jesus. Secondly, worship Jesus. We know from the scriptures that God inhabits the praises of his people. We're about to close here in worship. And we know that God does something special in worship. We've already talked about it. And so um, the second P that we talked about was the presence of God. If, if we want the presence of God in a special and unique way, I believe we have to be a people who enter into consistent worship because God inhabits the praises of his people. So it's my encouragement that we would be multiple times during the day on Spotify or Pandora or YouTube taking a 10 or 12 minute break and just worshiping Jesus by ourselves or with our family in order to experience his presence and know that he is God. And then finally, call Jesus. Call upon the name of the Lord. The scripture, said, the scripture calls us to call upon the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, all who call upon the Lord shall be saved. And I believe that's on repeat right now. Yes, that's for initial salvation. When somebody understands that Christ died for them and was resurrected from the dead, they can call upon the Lord. That means they turn from their sin and, and their former life, and they're like, Jesus what you did for me is enough, and I want what you have. Jesus, yes. Jesus, I come to you. That's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord initially for salvation. But I believe that the church, myself, you guys, we need to call upon the name of the Lord just like we did when we got saved. We need to have faith and repentance and call out the name of Jesus. I believe firmly there is power in the name of Jesus because when we call the name of Jesus, it's like we're beckoning the commander of those armies. Come, be close. I need you. Now, I know that we've used this illustration before, but as we close and because we're going to enter into worship. I'm going to call Frankie to come on up here. Frankie, would you come here, please? Just stand right here next to me, please. I'm not going to have you do anything crazy or weird, okay? All right, so cool. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Frankie's been here the whole time. You know that, right? He was, he was in the background of worship before, and he's been sitting in that chair the whole time. He was actually here before I got here. But when I called the name of Frankie, he came toward me in nearness and even in power, if you will, in a way that I wasn't experiencing before. I'm touching Frankie right now. I'm being reminded of how Frankie and I on Wednesday mornings do the, 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 the prayer and the worship, and I have had so many amazing moments with this guy seeking the Lord. My heart is encouraged as being near him. He's been here the whole time, but because I called his name, it's like I'm reminded of so many good times of seeking Jesus and seeing God do a work in this guy's life that is unexplainable that now it's like, let's go. We got to say, no, you can't go. You can't go. You, don't, you can't go. No way. I need Frankie here because you know what happens when you call out to the name of Jesus some of those similar things happen, and before you know it, you start walking in courage and confidence that you didn't have. Why? Because you called near the person living and active named Jesus who's got what you need. But you listen, you have to call his name. You have to call upon the name of the Lord, just like I called Frankie, and now I'm experiencing something different with him than I did before. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up here, and I'm going to be done. We're going to finish in a song. I was thinking of a phrase that I wanted you guys to, like, have on your lips, and it was, I, just, I just, like, wasn't, I don't know, didn't seem to be creatively coming up with one that was like, oh, that's awesome. And um, I feel like God was just kind of, like, reminding me that simple's good, 
and uh, like I've, I've shared this with you before, but I believe that as you remember Jesus and you worship Jesus and you call Jesus, as you are still and know that God is God, there's a, like a response phrase that should be very appropriate, especially when you find yourself maybe wandering or worrying. And it's very simply this, Jesus, you've got this. Over and over and over again. How cool would it be as we walk through this week, whatever it might look like, that we just had on our lips, Jesus, you've got this. Jesus, you've got this. Jesus, you've got this. We're going to sing now about the name of the Lord. And I pray that the Holy Spirit reminds you and encourages you, Jesus, Jesus.